Thank you, Don. Thank you, Gail. Pop up choir. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to everybody who is here in the sanctuary today, as well as all those folks out there in virtual world. As we say just about every week here, no matter how you show up, we are always glad to see you. So welcome, welcome. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. I'm going to start with a question. Has anyone else here seen those progressive insurance commercials about the young homeowners becoming their parents? Yes, I love those too, Lynn. I love them because I think they're hilarious because they are so true. Oh, yeah. My favorite one so far is when the group of young homeowners and their therapists show up at a dumpster and they've all brought old items from their home to throw away. And one woman steps up with all these empty butter containers and she says, empty butter containers are for recycle, not for my leftovers, and tosses them. The therapist says, that's a big one. That's a big one. Another guy steps up with this big pile of papers and he says, this is the owner's manual for my juicer. And he tosses it. And the therapist says, do you even own that juicer? No. <laughs> Didn't even own the juicer. And finally, another man steps up with this old crown molding. Why? Because the guy says, you never know when you're going to need some crown molding. <laughs> The therapist says, I know when, and it is never. <laughs> yeah, we're laughing, and some of us might be a little bit uncomfortable. Why? Because I think we sometimes see ourselves in those commercials, right? It's a bit like swearing that you're never going to say or do some of the things that your parents said or did. And then one day we open up our mouth and our parents just roll out, right? Isn't that the weirdest thing when that happens? Karma, people. I'm telling you, karma. Okay, so we have our series this month with a series titled, like, Let It Go. And an entry like I just shared there. Pretty sure everyone has figured out for the next few weeks we're going to be talking about letting things go. We're going to be talking about release. After all, it is the season of Lent. And I wanted to start out by offering some really interesting historical tidbits about Lenten observances. You know, a little bit of educational moment there, but as I did my research, I found that just like all religious experiences, different people have different ways of observing Lent. And there's no way you can cover all of that. Some people will observe Lent and others do not. So I'm just going to offer a highlight. And that highlight most of us know is usually people try to release something for the 40-day period that we call Lent. For some people, you know, a big one is Chocolate, that's one we hear a lot, people. Somebody gives up chocolate for Lent. Of course, this year, Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, Valentine's Day. It's kind of like eat chocolate day, right? Valentine. Ash Wednesday, yeah, they weren't, somebody planning the church calendar didn't think that one through, did they? Some people use Lent as a springboard to start living a healthier lifestyle right? And that's good. You know, for some people, we've heard this, some people give up alcohol during the 40 days of Lent with the goal of possibly continuing that abstinence after Easter. Others practice what I call the Lenten combo. They give something up and then they replace it with a healthier or more positive habit. It's almost like New Year's resolutions 2.0. 
So if you, you know, if you didn't keep your New Year's resolution, now Lent might be a chance to kick it off again. And I think that's great because any time that we can release something that no longer serves us and we replace it with something better, I say do it. So I'm going to start this series with talking about the power of release. And for some of you, this is going to be a review. The power of release. Power of release, technically, is one of the 12 powers that uh, was introduced to us by Charles Fillmore. Basically, Charles taught that each of us has 12 powers, and those powers are located in specific areas of our bodies. He assigned one of the 12 apostles to each one of the powers. And then as the years rolled on, other people added colors and other information about the powers. I'll be honest here, sometimes the apostle and the location and the body and the color and so forth of these powers make sense to me. For example, the apostle John is the apostle for love, right? And in the Bible, John is seen as the apostle whom Jesus loved, right? And the power is located in the heart area, and the color is red. It all makes sense. Release. Release or elimination, as Charles called it, is like in our abdominal area, in the digestive area. And the color is brown, like the russet potato, right? So when you think about elimination and you think about digestive processes, the color and the location of release makes sense. The apostle, Thaddeus. Why? I have no clue. And I read the 12 powers of man. I just read through this stuff, and I haven't found anything. If anybody knows why Thaddeus is the apostle for the power of release, please let me know. I would love to know. <laughs> release. Release is a power to discard, to let go, to dismiss, liberate. For example, when we take steps to eliminate a negative habit from our lives, we are practicing release. When we clean our homes, you know, we got spring coming up. Some people do spring cleaning. My mother did it back in the day. Smelled like, the house smelled like someone had passed a pine tree because it was pine saw just all over the place, right? Spring cleaning. We clean out our garages. We clean out our attics. All of that is activating our power of release. So it sounds pretty simple, right? Yes and no. The concept of release is simple. Practicing it is a whole different ball game. Why? One, we like our stuff. We like our emotional stuff, and we like our material stuff. And just like prosperity is about more than just material things and money and so forth, Release is about more than our material stuff. Again, it's like our closely held beliefs, embedded theologies, political viewpoints, our ideas about what a real church is or what a real spiritual path is. Any of those things all involve the power of release. And they can all, and we have trouble letting go of some of that stuff, right? So what I'm saying here is, physically, our homes could be spotless and have perfect feng shui, or if we work, our offices could be just perfectly outlined. We could be the most organized people on the planet physically, but our emotional and social and spiritual lives could actually be the subject of an episode of Hoarders on TV. Y'all seen that? Yeah. So with that in mind, over the next few weeks, I'm going to be focusing more on attitudes and behaviors, which challenge us from time to time. And these behaviors didn't ch don't challenge just us. Spiritual masters like the Buddha and our master teacher, Jesus, faced these things and had to address them. And while I'm certainly not going to be able to hit all the topics and behaviors, hopefully what we do learn 
is going to be able to help us address behaviors as they come up to address how to let go of those things which no longer serve us. That's the foundation. That's the plan. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm going to do something a little different today. I usually do Bible or Jesus or the film wars or something. I'm going to start with a little Buddhism. Okay? Buddhism teaches that there is suffering in life. And there is suffering in life because, because we are attached to things. We are attached either to material things or to behaviors. And the good news is, at least in Buddhist teachings, that we can alleviate our suffering by letting that stuff go. And you let that stuff go by following the eightfold path of Buddhism, which emphasizes moderation in all areas of life. Makes sense, right? Even if you're not Buddhist or you're not interested in learning about Buddhism, those first two points about their suffering in life and it's because we're attached to things usually, that makes sense. So why can't we let go of our stuff? Even if we know it is better for us to do so. Well, I've already mentioned we like our stuff. We like our material stuff. We like our emotional stuff. We like our spiritual stuff. But even deeper than that, I think a lot of this is tied to ego. And I know some people teach that ego is always bad. We have to let go of the ego. And I disagree. I believe there's a place for ego. I believe there's a place for a healthy ego. Healthy ego involves a profound sense of self-awareness. People with healthy ego know who they are or they're willing to learn more about who they are. We have a sense of profound self-awareness. We know and we accept our strengths and our responsibilities and we know that we don't know it all. We know that we have challenges and we're willing to work on those. We're willing and open to learn from others and to continue growing. We're willing to consider change. We're willing to consider other viewpoints, even when it makes us very, very uncomfortable. I believe it's unhealthy ego that's the issue here. And we see it a lot. What do I say? Turn on the TV, watch the news. All kinds of unhealthy ego. I mean, it's one thing for people to stand up or someone to stand up and say that they have a plan to address some of the serious challenges we face. We need everybody, right? We need people with gifts and intelligence and skills to step up and help us address the challenges we face today. That's great. But it's an other thing altogether for someone to stand up and claim that they are the only ones who have the answer, that they alone can fix this mess. We have to have them and we have to follow their way. Unhealthy, unhealthy ego cannot handle rejection either. It cannot handle differing viewpoints. It cannot accept healthy criticism, or different opinions. Now, it's true that sometimes no. people do treat us unfairly, right? Sometimes people gang up on us and call us names or things. And that, that's not fair. That, that's wrong. I get that. And it's right to be concerned and even upset about that. And sometimes we make mistakes in judgment. We do things that the Buddhists would say are not skillful. No. And there are consequences for that. Yet an unhealthy ego cannot accept that. An unhealthy ego always has to have a way to blame others. Oh. Unhealthy ego says, I didn't do it. It's somebody else's fault. Oh. I didn't have a choice. So with that in mind, what I propose that the first thing on our 2024 Lenten list to let go of is unhealthy expressions of ego. 
And how can we do that? We do that by checking ourselves. We check ourselves. We check our responses. We try to learn to respond rather than react. Because the only person I can change, the only person's response I can change is mine. And the only person you can change is you. Our master teacher Jesus sets a good example for us here. In the book of Matthew, we read where he went into the wilderness for a time of prayer and fasting. And we're told that while he was there, the devil tempted Jesus. And at one point, the devil takes Jesus up to a mountain and he shows him the kingdoms of the world and says, you could have all of this. I'll give it all to you. All you have to do is bow to me. In unity, we don't really teach that the devil is an actual being or a personification or a supernatural being who comes to tempt us. We teach that the devil represents all those thoughts held in consciousness which are adverse to divine mind or adverse to God. So we can say the devil for us represents all those things which tempt us to act from our lower selves or to act not from our best and highest selves. It represents perhaps the temptation to use our power and influence because we all have a certain amount of power and influence. It tempts us to use those powers only for our benefit. Forget everybody else. It's all about us. Like Jesus, we can have it all. All we have to do is bow, not to the devil, bow to ego. Jesus resisted this temptation through prayer and through relying on the spiritual truths that he knew, through the scriptures that he knew at that time. Scripture closes the story by saying that the devil left him until a more opportune time. In other words, unhealthy expressions of ego, the devil, unhealthy expressions of ego are always around the corner, right? They're going to pop up at times in our lives when the circumstances are right. So it's important to remember that, not to be afraid and not to be paranoid about it, but just remember it's a possibility. In another story in the Bible, a group of uh, people called the Samaritans had a village. Jesus and the disciples show up. They needed a place to stay, and the Samaritans refused to host them. The disciples asked Jesus, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven and just wipe these people out? Now, there's some unhealthy ego in action, right? <laughs> you don't like us? Hey, we'll show you. We are your retribution, you know, we're going to wipe you out. Jesus just looks at them basically and says, what? He says in the Bible, there are some, some of the translations add this comment from Jesus. He says, you do not know the spirit of which you are. In other words, guys, this is just your unhealthy ego at work here. You are made of a different spirit. You are made of something higher. Yeah, it's, it's annoying that they're not going to host us. Let it go. Move on. And Scripture ends the story by saying they left the village. And the village was intact, by the way. They let it go, and they moved on. Now, let's be honest here. All of us have been the disciples at one time or another, right? Yeah, we may not have wanted to call fire down from heaven, or maybe we did, but there have been those times when people have refused to accept us, our ideas, our opinions, our points of view. They have refused to accept it. Maybe they've even been nasty and mean and hostile toward us. And it's normal to be angry about that. I'm not saying it's okay. It's not. At the same time, however, our way shower Jesus reminds us we're made of something, 
something different. We, we have a spirit within us. Our true identity is spirit. We are expressions of God. Therefore, we are called to respond from another place, from a higher plane, from a healthy sense of self-awareness. We respond from that and we don't react from our bruised egos. What I'm saying is, stand in your truth. Then release it, let it go, move on. We've heard that we, we've heard it said that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And in unity, we teach that we are expressions of this spirit. We are expressions of God. Scripture reminds us in the book of Philippians that Jesus was very self-aware. He was aware of his identity, of his oneness with God. He was also aware, I believe, of the power and responsibility that came from that awareness. Jesus, however, did not exploit that power for his own benefit. Rather, he emptied himself in service. So what does that mean for us? It means you have homework again. Here is your reflection question for the week. Jesus was aware of his identity and the power and responsibility that came with it. Are we? Remember what Jesus said in the Gospel of John? For those who believe they will do the works I do and even greater works will they do. Basically, if I can do it, folks, if you believe, so can you. With that power comes a lot of responsibility. Are we aware of how powerful we are? Are we aware of the responsibility that comes with the gift of such power? And if we are, how are we going to respond? The choice is always ours, you know. My prayer, let's choose wisely. And so it is. Mm -hmm.